it's not uncommon to hear people suggest that God is not good. And their evidence for that is the fact that uh, the world is a messed up place. People, that things are broken, there is difficulty, there are wars and starvation, there is pain and suffering, and this is supposed to be evidence that God is not good, otherwise he would take care of it. However, I think a, a deeper concern that people often have is that they're not convinced God is good because their life is messed up. That things are difficult in their life and with things that are going on, and they just, that God is either just not good, or He doesn't care, or He's incompetent, or He's just absent. And those are very different questions. It's a very different question to say, why is there pain and suffering, than to say, why am I suffering and am in pain? You understand how those are two different questions? That second one is what we're going to be addressing this morning. Because as we kind of look at this idea that I think fundamentally understanding that God is at work and directing, even in the midst of difficult life circumstances, is, would make us extremely, well, if not powerful, at least strong. Think about the strength you would have if you could recognize that even when things are going poorly in your life, that you would be convinced that God is at work and is doing miraculous, wonderful things. We have been doing a series lately uh, that we started a few months ago uh, called Stories in Genesis, where I am encouraging you that I will put up a story. You have bookmarks in there. This is true this week, Genesis 37, with an encouragement to read that this week. With the idea that there are certain stories in Genesis we should all know. It would be great if we all knew all of Genesis, but we curated a few stories to try to get you in the habit and hopefully become addicted to reading Scripture. And so we aren't necessarily reading that, and I would love to know, by the way. I would love if you'd be willing to come up maybe during the potluck afterwards, or we can talk. I'd love to know how that's going for you. Are you keeping up? Are you actually reading the stories from week to week? Do you find that helpful? Uh, to do it that way, would you rather instead we give it to you a week ahead of time and then talk about it? However that works, or whether you're just saying, I always intend to, but I don't really follow through, I'd, I'd love to know. But this week, we are, we are going to continue that, and we're going to do that for the next you know, four or so weeks, about another month or so, as we continue in stories. But every one of these stories from here on out is about Joseph. And I, I was thinking about just retitling the series at this point, The Gospel According to Joseph. And with the idea behind it, because uh, I know Tim Keller, who I admire, uh, was a pastor of mine in New York City, uh, that, that he did a series decades ago with that very title, Talking About Joseph. And it was super impactful for me, and I'm going to share some of those things with you this morning. But we need to understand that there is something going on. So let me catch you up. If you're not familiar with the story or you're, uh, you don't really remember, this is the uh, previously on stories in Genesis. So remember that God had reached out to Abraham and said, I am going to make you the father of many nations. As a matter of fact, it was Abram at the time, and his name was changed to Abraham to reflect that reality. And he's, he says, I'm going to promise, I'm going to bless all nations through you. And so Abraham has a series of trials and learning to trust God and finally has a son, Isaac. And Isaac is born and uh, uh, finally, and he has a couple of sons himself, Jacob and Esau. And we uh, read a little bit about that as they began to struggle back and forth. But Jacob is uh, not the one that is uh, loved of God. And or loved by his father, and Esau was. And Jacob, though, ends up uh, through trickery and all kinds of things, becomes the, the heir apparent to the blessing and the ongoing uh, promise of God. And as he does this, his name is actually changed to Israel. Now, we're picking up the story here as Israel. It's Jacob, same guy. He has 12 sons. Matter of fact, if, if you had always been wondering why we always say there are 12 tribes of Israel, because there are 12 sons that Israel had. And so we're picking up the story here in Genesis 37, and it is the story 
that you will read this week of, of a father, Israel, who loves primarily one son. He loves Joseph and favors Joseph to the point that the other brothers start to resent it. And that resentment gets added to as he begins to tell stories. Joseph has these dreams, these visions from God that he is one day going to rule, not only over his brothers, but over his mom and dad as well, that they will bow to him. And not only do they think he's crazy, because that's not how the world works, but they also start to resent him. That bitterness uh, boils up in the fact that at one point they conspire to kill Joseph and hide it from their father. But instead of killing him, instead they sell him into slavery. Matter of fact, here's the curated part here in Genesis that says this. Well, I'll, I'll read it in a second. It's all caught up in there. But I want to tell you that, that, that we need to know that for Joseph, when he is going through this, when he's thrown into a well, when he is sold into slavery, when his brothers seize upon him, that life isn't going well. And he knows it's not going well. And, and, but you're going to see over the next few weeks that things happen in an amazing way. And this is the beginning of that story. That God does something miraculous in the midst of of all of this, that, that saves a nation, that saves a family, that saves individuals, and for you and I to know that in his life and our life as well, that really difficult, horrible, bad family dynamics and circumstances and situations can actually be used of God for great and wonderful purposes. And we're going to see that over the next few weeks. But to really get that in our lives, to really get it, we've got to understand a couple of things. We need to understand about the explosiveness of sin, and we need to understand about the invisible hand of God. Let's take these in turn. The first and the first blank in your outline is the explosiveness of sin. Here's what I'm trying to get at when I talk about the explosiveness of sin. You know, uh, my, my children went to Deep Creek, Damascus, but uh, my son particularly, but they had different uh, buildings that they had used, but he was playing soccer at one of them. And, and I remember uh, his mom asking him, say, hey, can you see Mount Hood from the soccer field? And he's like, I, I don't know. So she had this picture uh, and during the soccer field. Luke didn't know if he could see it. Like you could see Mount Hood from the playground. Like this big, imposing, beautiful. Here's a better picture. This was also taken in Damascus. That you can see this, 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 this mountain here that is just solid and beautiful. And, and I have to tell you, not only is it big and majestic looking, like there's very few things in the world that seem as solid and unmoving as a mountain. Here's another picture of a mountain. For those of you who know, uh, the left is a pre-1980 picture of Mount St. Helen. And that is a picture a little bit closer today, or at least after 1980. That what had happened is as this uh, mountain is there, like it seems unmovable, it seems solid from all intents, but from the outside it looks. But what was happening is there was something within as as as, as th that was boiling up, that was adding, adding pressure until finally it explodes and sends ash everywhere. We remember back in the 80s, uh, I mentioned that Lisa's family lived in the area, that they would, you know, able to collect, and this happened to probably some of you, collecting ash from Mount St. Ellen in your yard. Forever. Was it forever? Just like tons of it. Because this immovable, by all intents and purposes, otherwise stable mountain had something within it that eventually built up enough pressure to explode. Sin is like that in our lives. As we are separated from as we try to live life separated from God, as we try to do things of our own power in our own way, that, that these things, okay, so it didn't really seem to matter today. Like I was able to get away with it. No real consequences. But eventually it can boil and to the point there is so much pressure it explodes. And this is exactly what happens for this family. As you read the story, you'll see that, that there's different. For, 
first we had Jacob. Here's, here's, the, uh, here's the passages in question. Now Israel, this is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. You may remember, uh, you know, sometimes it says it's this uh, many-colored coat or the coat of many colors or, or another translation. It's hard to actually translate, apparently, that it can mean like really richly ornate or really long sleeves. But whatever, the, here, the key is it was an expensive gift that was favored to one son particularly. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. And then later in verse 9, it says, then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. The thing I want to get at, just even in this verse, you're going to see it more fleshed out in the story when you read it this way, is that each of these groups really were dealing with this bubbling, pressure-building issues and sin in their own life. For Israel, it was his idolatry. So next blank in your outline, Israel's idolatry. See, what's going on here is, for, for you remember that, Jacob grew up very clearly not loved by his dad. His dad loved his brother, and it was very open, very clear, and as he longed desperately, so desperately for that love and blessing from his dad, and couldn't get it directly. And so as he longed for that, that, that he, he ended up taking off and, and hiding and going to another land, and he met Rachel. And Rachel was, was beautiful and amazing, as all Rachels are. But uh, what had happened is uh, he des- desperately wanted Rachel realizing, if I can have Rachel in my life, then everything will be good. And spent a decade plus trying to get Rachel in his life. And finally, it's beautiful. He ended up, you know, he was tricked by his uncle and ended up having to marry uh, the older sister first and then uh, ends up marrying uh, Rachel. Finally has her in his life. And as he has sons, and two, he had two sons by Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. And, and she died giving birth to the youngest one. But Joseph was the eldest son of Rachel and became the focus of of all the love and attention that Jacob slash Israel had to offer. He adored Joseph. So that idolatry, that, that, that I have to have this in my life. Without this in my life, my life is meaningless. You will actually see him say those kind of things. That he will begin to mourn forever because he thought he had lost Joseph. That as he does this and as he struggles, that, that becomes his major focus And it's a sin that's going to boil over and cause problems for him, for his brothers. We also see the brothers in the next blank have bitterness. As they continue to strike and they they see that he, not only the bitterness, the fact that their father loved him more, they actually begin to have bitterness because of his visions and his dreams. That he, they had a sense that one day he's saying, I'm going to rule over you. And you got to realize how absolutely insane and crazy this sounded. You see, one of the things that's hard for a lot of modern American people to remember and understand about most of the world, and certainly the ancient world, and and this one in particular, is how hierarchical and patriarchal it was. That it is absolutely understood that, that men are greater than women, that the older are greater than the younger. That's the way their society operated, and that's what you're going to do, that you're going to look up to them, and that always, that the, that, 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 Parents are looked up to and listened to by their kids. No matter how old you are, your parents are going to be more important and their voice is going to be more important. No matter, and, and, and the younger brothers are supposed to look up to the older brothers. Like it's this way and the older brother leads the younger and the parents lead the older brothers. And this was just how it's done. This is how society is supposed to be, so they thought. And so to have him say, as one of the youngest here, that you will bow down to the youngest, that mom and dad will eventually bow down to the youngest, says there that at one point Israel had to rebuke like, like a, a, somebody coming after a child saying, you are way out of line, even to his favored son, as he says these kind of things. They were bitter, and this guy is nuts, and yet the father loves him, and he has this. 
they have their bitterness and it begins to boil over this, this explosive nature, building up pressure till it blows the mountaintop. And then you have Joseph's pride. I don't know what else word to use here. I mean, that's a biblical word, but it's a hubris. It's, it's, this, it's this crazy evilness that realize what happened. So he goes and he has this dream. He has this dream that his brothers are going to bow down to him. It's pretty clear the understanding of the dream. The brothers get it. And, and they are angry at him, bitter and resentful. And yet, so he has this other dream and he tells them it too. Without any pause, without any sense, the text doesn't indicate anything but a hubris that, eh, I'm just going to keep seeing. Almost, I wonder if he's like, eh, hey, had another one. That, that his, his unwillingness to see that how crazy they were making that was, and with all the difficulty and just secure in his own position, that he was on this path of, of what? kind of this disregarded selfishness that I'm just going to speak what I'm going to speak and let them deal with it. Evil. And that was the path that was going to boil up for him and finally explode. So they're each dealing with these, and it leads to this conclusion that the brothers finally grab Joseph. It says, that, matter of fact, you'll see this in the text. One, it says they seize him. That that seizing, that grabbing, it's like a violent grabbing and pulling and yanking and grappling. That they are, they are not kind about this at all. And they strip him. Not just take off his cloak. Again, the, 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 the Hebrew there is that they, they rip him naked. They strip off his clothes. And then they drop him. They throw him in a cistern. And that dropping is, is also a, a horrible word. It's, it's the word that is used to you know, drop a body into a grave. That for, for all intents and purposes, they were just, let's let him die. And while it's not recorded here, it is recorded later that, that, that uh, uh, Joseph said he was pleading, they were pleading for his life to his brothers. Begging that they wouldn't do this. Please don't let me die. Don't kill me as they beg him and beg him and they do this anyway. And he's at the bottom of this cistern. They were going to kill him, but instead they decide to sell him to slavery. Uh, there's some, some of the other brothers were trying to help keep that from happening, but as it ends up happening, and, and you think about where Joseph's life is. There in the darkness crying out to God, pleading to his brothers that he would be saved. And there's no answer. A number of you know this story. You know where this goes, but sit with that a moment. In the midst of the darkness, in the pain and the suffering and the fear, Joseph cries out and hears nothing. I think you and I need to be aware of this too. We need to understand the invisible hand of God. You see what's really interesting about this passage? God is not mentioned. He's not even referred to in this entire chapter. You'd be hard-pressed to find any other chapter in Genesis where that's true. Like, he's not even mentioned, but we know that, that see, here's what the, the, the author, the narrator is, is doing here that's just so brilliant as he's telling the story that, that we know where it's going to end up, and yet we see that God is at work, that there is something amazing, that what God is going to do, I'm going to spoil it a little bit, uh, but that at least give you hints, that at one point, Joseph is going to save thousands because of the actions that he does. Not only is he going to save thousands, he's going to save his family. His family is going to be able to continue to live. Because of what happens here, he too will be saved. And these kind of things are just amazing. 
But what we're also going to do is we're going to have individuals that are changed. We're going to have Israel. We're going to have Jacob, Israel, be able to see differently and, and how he has perceived his family before. We're going to see the brothers that are going to be able to forgive. We're going to see Joseph gain a whole sense of humility. These wonderful things, these struggles, this boiler plate, these, uh, this boiling pressure of, of a volcanic eruption that, that erupted somewhat is, is actually going to be changed by God. He's going to work the miracle in the individuals. He's going to work the individual for, his, for this nation. And he's going to work a miracle that will actually lead to our very salvation because this is the line that, that God had promised that Jesus himself is coming from. All of these things happen. Notice something in this passage. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. This is how this passage ends. Because it's going to lead to the next story, the next and the next piece. That all of this, everything that happened in this chapter gets to this point. But think about all the stuff. As you read it, look at all the stuff that's going to have had to happen. To get to this point is crazy. So first thing is there had to be this, well, I'm just going to say it this way. One is just the coincidences that have to happen. And I put it in quotes. Because I don't think they're coincidences. It's too coincidental to be coincidence. Like what's going on here is, is powerful. That, that Joseph had to be separated from his brothers at some point. His brothers had to go out and, and, and go to, this, to, to Shechem and be in this one area. And he was, meanwhile, he had to go to them. Well, had he gone there, he had, the th fact is, is they moved from Shechem to Dothan, and they had moved to this re more remote place, and so he had to happen to find the stranger. Joseph had to happen to find the stranger to know to go to Dothan. But the stranger had to have left before his brothers saw him and were able to capture him. And then the brothers had to capture him, but they had to not kill him. Because if they killed him, then this would have been a problem. But they didn't kill him because Reuben was there. But then Reuben wasn't there when uh, they ended up selling him into slavery. So they had to throw him into a cistern. And he had to survive that. And then these certain uh, slavers had to go by for them to be sold to, for him to eventually get to there. There were so many things. And if any one of those pieces went wrong, the stranger wasn't around for him to find Dothan or uh, the brother, but he was still around or he was killed but not captured. He was killed, uh, would have been that, but, or maybe he was not killed, but he was never sold to slavery. Like all these things had to happen. All these difficulties, all these problems, all this had to go. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked. The coincidences. The invisible hand of God. For him to be able to save the nation, to change people's lives. To help Joseph become who he was supposed to be. For his brothers to get over this. And you may be sitting there going, Bill, it didn't have to happen that way. I mean, this is Portland. There's always somebody who wants to argue with the preacher. You know, it could have happened this way. He could have just sent an angel. God could have just sent an angel. If, and an angel came and said, by the way, I'm an angel from God, and I want you, Joseph, to know you're a spoiled little brat. And, and you brothers, you know, you've got some bitterness there. And J Jacob, you're an idolater. And, and for them to all go, oh, that's so true. Oh, man, this is amazing. Uh, we repent now, and they all grab hands and then go off into the sunset singing kumbaya like that would be great but it's never going to happen that way i mean my life is any indication it's not enough just to tell me about my sin i gotta i gotta discover it i'm some angel it's not going to work and i don't know whether you believe this or not but the thing is is the bible is true and it's dealing with reality, dealing with real people that are in these kind of crazy, mixed up places. And that they need something desperately. And, and it's not that God doesn't do miracles. You know, here's an interesting thing. Dothan, it's mentioned in Scripture again later, centuries later. In another one of these passages, one of my favorite passages in Scripture with Elijah and uh, Elisha, and, and he's there, and by that time, it's this big city, and, and these armies are coming up against him, and, they're there, and he's there with his servant, 
and uh, Elisha is, and they're like, oh, what are we going to do with these armies? And he begins to pray and say, uh, God, let him see what's going on. And that's literally where the phrase comes from, chariots of fire. He begins to see chariots of fire surrounding and that end up this entire army, this miraculous army that God uses and blinds this other army and they are safe. And, and I have to say, like, that's what I want to have happen when I pray. I really want that, 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 that I would pray and that I have a difficult circumstance and then all of a sudden as that happens, that boom, God just says, sends angels army and chariots of fire and everything's fixed. And I guess what truth is, is Elisha needed that. But what they needed was something radically different. They needed something that would change their lives. And God offered an answer for them that was different than he gave Elisha. And realize what that means. God took care of Elisha as much as he took care of Joseph and his family. God loved Jacob and his brothers, Israel, and, and, and his sons, and Joseph, and he loved them just as much in not answering this in this miraculous way, in, in the same looking miraculous way as he did for Elisha. That it's the same God, the same love, the same plan, the same agenda that he is going to do. That just as much that God, in His apparent silence to you, in the way that you can't see Him, is just as present and involved in your life as He is in Elisha's, in the miracles. And then one other thing. There's this theme that just happens and you can't help but see it as you read Scripture over and over right here in Genesis that continues on, and this upside-down twist that God keeps seeming to do that takes our expectations and just flips them. You see, Joseph, all he wanted was to just get out of the cistern, to be safe, to be with his dad again. And God says, I got a nation to save. I have a world to save. We've got something going on and you have no idea how messed up this is going to be. I choose the younger over the older. I choose the son over the father. I choose over and over. He's going to twist our expectations. The way we order society and the way we think the rules and the way we think things are supposed to happen, what is normal God's going to mess it up. God isn't interested in your and I's definition, much less society or America or the ancient patriarchs. In our idea of what is good and natural, God has a whole other agenda, and it's going to flip that on its head. That, that in the midst of what's going on, sacrifice becomes more important than power. We see those themes somewhere else. As we continue to know our Bible, we see another character beaten, stripped, pleading to his father and in the dark. Jesus' death on a cross was all those things. And it would have looked nuts. God on a cross? Victory? as you're executed to death? It was nuts until it wasn't. God is at work in crazy, amazing ways. And I need you to hear this, especially if you are facing a difficulty in your life right now. A health issue, a relationship issue, the loss of someone, just you can't understand what's going on. You have a plan and a purpose, and you don't understand why God doesn't just show up and fix it the way He's going to fix because God is doing something amazing. And if you can hold on to the idea that even in the brokenness, even in the messed upness, that God has a plan for you, that God is doing something amazing. It will give you not only the strength to deal with the difficult times, but the humility to just be able to say, wherever I am, I just want to be focused on God. Because here's the crazy thing. Joseph didn't have to understand what God was doing to be able to be part of God's plan. 
You and I don't have to figure it out. Like I do, I pray, God, what do you want from Linwood? What do you want from me? What do you want from my family? What do you want from this city? What do you want for our, for our, our nation? Like what should we be doing? And God doesn't, has yet to send me the letter with all the checklist. He just says, remain in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. It's the whole focus of our, the whole point of our fall thing to, to reconnect, to recommit, to refocus. We're going to have a lot of opportunities together that we're going to do. The whole point of each of these things that we do is to help you and I just be doing what God wants us to do, present as God wants us to be present, living that out, and let's let God work the miracle, shall we? Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that you are at work in our lives even when we can't see it, that you are at work in our lives even in the midst of our brokenness. Lord, I want to take the sin seriously. Like I look at how those family dynamics were, and I suppose I could learn the lesson. Yeah, don't do that. But I feel like there's so much more of what you're trying to tell us. That this story of how you work with broken, messed up people, that you want to transform us and change us and grow us, but meanwhile you've got a plan and that we can just rest. I want to say a special prayer now for those who are going through really difficult times. I ask, Lord, that you help them to see that you are the God of resurrections. That not only for literal death in the case of your son and our eventual uh, death and rebirth and for those of, the, of us that are in Christ, but Lord, even the figurative, the deaths, the sacrifices, the struggles, the pains that people are going through. I don't know, I'd like to pray that you would show them where it's all going to be, but really I'm just asking that you show them that you're there. And frankly, Lord, we need that in the good times as well. Help us to just be present and available to you. So for the millionth time, Lord, or for those who it may be the first time, we simply pray, forgive my sins. I'm sorry, and as best as I know, I want to follow you. I accept your sacrifice, your pain, your suffering, and your plan and agenda. Help me to live as you would have me live. And I will just enjoy the miracles and give you the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's have a few moments of open worship. If God puts something on your heart, you can share it. I'll close this in a couple minutes.